Well, good morning, and welcome to this edition of San Diego People. I'm Kevin Faulkner. San Diego's homeless population has reached record highs since the start of the pandemic. And according to a recent count, more than 4,000 San Diegans are living on the streets countywide. Joining me this morning to address this problem and possible solutions is the president and CEO of the San Diego Rescue Mission, Donnie D. Donnie, good morning. Thank you for joining me. Good to be here with you. Well, I will tell you, um, you have such an interesting career. Uh, you started uh, in athletics, uh, in the NFL, for a couple of years. Uh, and then how did you find yourself transitioning to running one of the most important, not just shelters, but a mission that helps people get their lives back on track? Yeah, uh, thanks for that. It has been quite a journey. I um, we grew up in an athletic family and so found myself playing a lot of sports, had the opportunity to play college and professional sports. And and I think sometimes that tackling and, and hitting a 290 pound lineman is easier than running a rescue mission. But uh, I love what I'm doing. And uh, and I left uh, an organization that I had been with for 27 years because I just felt a, a calling uh, on my life to do this. And and I also wanted to just leave this place better than I found it. My wife and I have been here for almost 30 years now, and our kids went to school here. My son went to USD, my daughter to UCI, they both played basketball. And, and I've taken a lot from Southern California and felt like that if I could be a part of helping to figure out this homeless situation, then my time here, I would have left it better than I found it. Well, I'll tell you, when, when you came in 2017, I, I vividly remember, you really had that sense of, of urgency. And one of the things that you said, you said, I want to change the state of homelessness in San Diego. I want to be a leader. I want the rescue mission to be a part of that. And in fact, you do that without any government dollars. Um, tell, me what, tell me what you do there at the rescue mission and how is it how are you really changing those lives and, and really turning things around? Well, we have a 100,000 square foot facility in downtown San Diego in Bankers Hill, actually, and it's a 360 bed facility. And so we take people in, 300 of those beds are used for faith-based 12 month rehab, which I believe is the solution uh, to our homeless situation is we have to address the issues of the heart. There is a drug and alcohol component. There is a housing component. There is an early childhood trauma uh, component. There is domestic violence component. But until we begin to really address the issues of the heart, all we're really doing is moving people around. And so what we do is we take them in. We call them students. And for 12 months, they work through a program, a, a clinical, a therapeutic, a job training, a, a spiritual program. And by the end, they go through a graduation and cap and gown. And they walk yeah. across the stage. And, and uh, you've uh, participated in yeah. that in the past. And it's really a highlight for us because these are people that put in the work to overcome homelessness uh, in their life. Well, and, and I have been there and I will tell you to see the smile on, on people's faces, mm -hmm. to know that they have been through something that has been life changing. Um, that's what we all want. That's what San Diegans want. And, and yet what we have seen, particularly in the last two years, that the situation on the streets is getting worse. Um, what's your thought? Is this a natural evolution? Are you seeing something different that didn't used to be? And, uh, and what should we be doing different? Well, I think it's a complicated issue. There's no doubt about it. And there's no quick fix. I mean, we've we've uh, taken several years to get to this place, and homelessness is as bad as it's ever been. There's more people with mental health problems, more people with drug and alcohol problems, more people with uh, challenges that they have to overcome that have really led them to the streets. But I, I think COVID exposed us for sure. Uh, people lost their jobs, and and they say most Americans are paycheck to paycheck anyway. Well, COVID exposed us because those month to month paycheck to paycheck people, I think a lot of them ended up on the streets. We've legalized drugs. Uh, I think that uh, the approach uh, of housing first does not work. I think there are others that agree with that, that the money that is being spent on this issue in the state of California has to be used for housing first, which just means that where the resources are being used are to get people off the streets and into some kind of shelter without addressing the issues of their heart. And so long term, we haven't changed anything other well, than their location. And, and I'll tell you, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I've, I've seen you know, so many folks that, that are understanding what you've already seen, which is housing first, we don't have the capacity to do that. Uh, and in fact, what do you do with individuals that are on the street now? Um, and one of the linchpins to that in San Diego is, you know, we have to have increased shelter capacity, but we don't because the two are tied hand in hand. Um, do we have enough shelter beds in San Diego? And what would you like to see differently? Well, we do not have enough shelter beds, but I think, uh that that's something that the politicians and electeds need to figure out and they need to address. I think that uh, if we could reallocate the housing first dollars, then maybe we could uh, build more 
shelters and uh, and and more places like that. We we're adding a 50 bed shelter in Oceanside and 162 bed shelter in National City that all be privately funded because we get that there has to be a place for people to go. Uh, you can't just uh, talk them into getting the help, and you can't you can't arrest them first. That we got to have a place to send them to do triage and figure out where you go next. I think there's also uh, needs to be a strategy to move people through the shelters. The shelters can't be a landing spot. And I think if you looked at the, the registrations and the people that are in many of these shelter beds, they've been there a while. Right. And so all that's doing, Kevin, is, is, uh, is clogging down the system so that we can't get other people through uh, to address the issues of homelessness and, and the issues of their heart and ultimately out living again and, and having overcome homelessness so that other people can now uh, benefit from the programs that exist. Well, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. And, and one of the things that I've always been impressed with, Donnie, uh, at the Rescue Mission is you, it's not about just getting somebody off the street for a day or a night. It's about how do we help somebody get back on their mm. feet? How do we make it, you know, that, that complete person? Um, so once you walk out of that academy, mm. once they have that graduation, um, they're ready to stand on their own to feet. They're ready to get that place uh, of their own. One of the things that we have seen, uh, particularly in the last several years, is, is really the rise of, of substance abuse and particularly fentanyl on the streets. Tell me how that's affecting what you are doing now versus what the rescue mission may have been doing you know, five, seven years ago. Well, we have drug and alcohol classes as a part of our program. Uh, we uh, have people that come into our program every week, and it doesn't take long for us to address kind of and assess them. What what are your challenges and what are your issues? And we've had people come in with a variety of addictions, a lot of alcohol too, and uh, and we're able through our case managers and through our therapists to really uh, address that. Uh, sometimes they're seeing uh, they're going to offsite clinics. Uh, many times they're seeing our therapist, and they're going to our onsite classes and. We feel like, though, that uh, that's a symptom. Uh, it's certainly something that's difficult to overcome, but there's something deeper that's going on in there, whether it was early childhood death, whether it was physical abuse, whether there was some dysfunction that happened in their past that actually has led them to want to mask all of the, the, the fear and the doubts and the insecurities that they're experiencing uh, by using and by drinking at the level that they are. When is somebody ready to break that cycle? You can't force somebody, obviously, into a shelter or into the rescue mission. How do you, how do you make that connection with folks on the street? Because I can't agree with you more. We have to get that person to say, I want to change. I want to do, you know, I want to intervene. How do you do that? You have to build trust. Uh, this is a relationship game, just like everything else, whether it's uh, you know sports or politics or business, mm -hmm. or it's a relationship game. And I, I think the unfortunate thing is, is that we look past people that are living on the streets. We walk past the people living on the streets. And I think if we can begin to engage them as a service provider, and I think we're doing this, and I think other service providers are doing this too, as we engage them and really hear their story and get them to understand that we can really help them, you know, what part of the reason that people on the streets resist services isn't because they want to necessarily live on the streets. It's because they don't trust anybody, and they've had no, bad shelter experiences. And so okay. we've got to build trust and get them to the place where they know that we're going to help them, we're going to stand by them as they go through this program. Couldn't agree with you more. The ones that are doing one of the best of the, in our city. We need, Thank you. We need more of you out there, my friend. Uh, I will tell you, coming up next, we're going to continue this conversation with Jared Wilson, who's president of the San Diego Police Officers Association, about policing of the homeless population that's happening on our streets and what we need to do about it. We'll be right back. The men and women of the San Diego Police Department continue to be on the front line of San Diego's homeless crisis. And joining me now to further touch on this topic is the president of the San Diego Police Officers Association, Jared Wilson. Jared, welcome. Thanks for having me on, Kevin. I you're, really appreciate it. Let's jump right into it. You're, you're a 20-year veteran of our police department. I think you've served in virtually every part of the city. You took over the Police Officers Association in 2022. Um, you've been very outspoken about what's going on on the street, particularly on the issue of homelessness. Um, tell me why it's getting worse out there on the streets. Well, there's, there's a variety of factors why it's getting worse. Um, one, our tolerance level for for the behavior we allow in the state of California since the passages of things like AB 109, Prop 47 in Sacramento. And then COVID uh, really impacted us all. And so despite having you know, record unemployment really in, in this region, we're seeing more and more homeless people on our streets. We're seeing hard drug use on our streets. And really when you look at, at downtown San Diego, an urban decay that hasn't been seen in, in certainly my lifetime and many other people's lifetimes, and it's spreading across our region. As I said, you know, the, the, our officers are on the front line on that. What, what changes have you noticed, particularly in, let's say, the last five years? And, and what, are your, what are the men and women 
telling you? You know, we're seeing heart drug use out in the open on city streets in downtown city. I myself was walking on 4th Avenue a few months ago, saw someone openly smoking a meth pipe. I wasn't on duty at the time and could not address it. But our officers, if I had called for that, the response time would have been over two hours for that call. And then, unfortunately, they would have had to write a citation for it. There's no accountability for it because we can't get the charges filed because the system is overwhelmed and the punishments are so low. There's really no accountability for some of this antisocial behavior that we're seeing on our streets. You know, you've talked a lot. You've been very outspoken recently, particularly on uh, officers and officers that have been, been leaving the department. You just mentioned, you know, a potential call like that might take two hours. Right. Um, what, are you seeing that more and more across the city? More and more. In, in the last two years, uh, we've lost a huge amount of officers, 500 officers since the, the end of 2020. And our response times uh, in correlation with that have, have exploded right now for, you know, something like quality of life issue like a theft in progress or a vandalism call which to a small business owner who's trying to operate their neighborhood market to take two hours for an officer to get to there is impacting the livelihoods of people yeah. from all the way from San Ysidro to downtown to Ranch Bernardo it's, it's awful but even worse it takes us 35 minutes to get to a, a life or death call and that's unacceptable yeah. Well, we certainly need uh, we certainly need more of you <laughs> that's something I've as you know I feel very strongly and passionately about mm -hmm. Um, you know, one of the interesting uh, things about homelessness, and I don't think a lot of our viewers would know, is that the number one referral source for folks getting off the streets and into shelter is our police officers. We got a lot of great providers that are out there doing mm -hmm. outreach on the work, um, you know, every single day out on the streets. But it's our police officers that are out there on the beat that are, the, as I said, the number one referral force to say, "Hey, we want you to to get into a shelter." Tell me, tell me, how does that work? What's what's that typically like for an officer out there? Well, anytime an officer uh, contacts someone who's homeless or having struggle finding find shelter. Uh, they have a resource list. Uh, even if they're a regular patrol officer on the street, there's p places they can direct to. Our neighborhood policing team, which is our specialist on that, they're broken into uh, neighborhood policing teams and homeless outreach teams. Yeah. They have a wide variety of resources. They have connections at the VAs. Our homeless outreach team officers are partnered with a county social worker and can get people into treatment facilities for mental health, uh, the Veterans Affairs, and, and a wide variety of other projects like the Alpha Project as well, too. Yeah. You know, I'll I, I tell you, when we started the Neighborhood Policing Division, it was a new division in the city of San Diego to do, address exactly what you want, to have that expertise on the street with our officers to say, hey, we're going to have this approach not just in downtown, but across the entire city. I think it, I think it worked very well. Uh, and in fact, San Diego was the only big city where we were reducing homelessness. Uh, what's it like right now for the Neighborhood Policing Division? How are we at, at strength? What are the officers telling you? Right. Well, it's similar to our patrol and investigative divisions where it's been cut almost in half for our officers. It's our focus has been answer emergency 911 calls. And so when we see quality of life issues, which are a huge complaint of our residents in the city, our number one complaint through things like the Get It Done app and through our phone calls is crime related to homelessness. Homelessness is not a crime in of itself. It's important to know that. However, there's unfortunately a lot of criminal activity that comes around these encampments, hard drug use, sexual assaults illegal lodging that impact everyone's day-to-day -day lives in the communities where these encampments occur. And our enforcement posture on it, unfortunately, has uh, been curtailed uh, due to things like COVID, due to the weakening of laws that don't hold people yeah. accountable for their actions. And uh, neighborhood policing has been drastically reduced. I mean, I'll tell you, it's got to be frustrating for our men and women that are wearing the badge that have put so much time and effort into neighborhood policing, into a, a system that was working, to see those numbers be decreased and, and to not have the ability and the, and the support to do what needs to be done on the street. That's correct. Um, uh, one of my neighborhood policing sergeants spoke with me this morning. Uh, and they talked about a situation in the gas lamp where someone was lodging in front of the spaghetti factory and they gave this person progressive enforcement. They tried to get them to the shelter, it was refused. They gave them a warning about the consequences of illegally lodging on the sidewalk right in front of this person's business. They refused to leave. They received a citation, they crumpled it up and threw it out right in front of the officers. Finally, the officers, and this is a several day process, arrested this individual at the beginning of their shift for the crimes that they were occurring. They were out and booked and released from county jail and back on the streets before those officers ended their shift. I, I, that's what makes so many people just their blood boil when you do it's that. outrageous somebody who was you know had that help and the support offered that help and services and then in terms of consequences when you have that consequences not be able to affect a real change you, right. you all need obviously the political support of everybody at, at city hall but you also need that enforcement of, the, of those laws that helps you do your job out there 
Yeah, it, you know, we often call the criminal justice system in the state of California now a revolving door. Uh, the, re door the door is revolving so fast at this point, it's just hitting our officers in the back as, as they turn it. It's, it's ridiculous. You know, one of the things that, um, to your point, and again, I'm so impressed, particularly our, our homeless outreach team, uh, our neighborhood policing division. I mean, I'm impressed with every officer that uh, we're fortunate enough to have, and we need more of them in San Diego. Um, but particularly that aspect of, you know, maybe you can, you can get to the, the point of it's not just, you know, wearing the badge and, and carrying a gun, but I, I've seen it firsthand that our men and women care so much and they want to be able to help. Again, back to being that number one referral source to our shelters. Um, but what's it like to be able to play in that role? Because you're here, you're here to enforce the law, but you're also you're also helping people and interacting. I mean, it's it's right. amazing to see. Their goal is always not to have to take any enforcement. It's to get people back on their feet, to rejoin society, and make sure that they have housing and a place to live. And so uh, that happens more often than not. You know, the people we see on the streets who who aren't getting help, you know, it's it's chronic. You know, it's the same people over and over. We are making successes with some people. There is not enough shelter beds, though. That's very clear in the city of San Diego. And um, we do have a lot of people that come from other, other localities that we house here in San Diego due to our good weather. Well, we'll get to that shelter beds in our, in our next segment. But I will tell you something that I've always strongly believed in, and I know you do too in the department, which is we have a lot of great folks that are out there on the street helping out every day. Uh, our officers don't necessarily have to be the front line, but there needs to be a bottom line. And if we don't have a bottom line, you're going to see, unfortunately, what we're starting to see in San Diego that we didn't used to see before. That's correct. Uh, people should not be allowed to smoke hard drugs in our public spaces and use their tents to conceal that, that behavior. It's unacceptable. You know, our parks are, are sometimes taken over and our children are not allowed to use them. And we do have a shortage of housing in the city, there's no doubt. But ultimately, the response to someone smoking drugs in a park should not be to give them an expensive condo in downtown San Diego. We have housing for people who want to break our laws, and it's called jail. And if you can't follow the rules, there has to be consequences and accountability for your actions. Well, more to come on those consequences. And after the break, we're going to have a roundtable discussion with the Rescue Mission and Jared Wilson from our San Diego Police Officers Association about what to do next. We'll be right back. We're continuing to talk about the growing homeless crisis in San Diego. Joined by Donnie D from the San Diego Rescue Mission and Jaron Wilson, who's the president of our Police Officers Association. Uh, we're here for our final segment together. Again, gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Uh, you know, one of the things that it struck me as we were talking earlier, you're, you're both on different sides of the equation, but yet it's so important that we have to work together. Donnie, from the service standpoint and the life-changing standpoint of the Rescue Mission, and, and Jared with our officers that are out there ensuring our and protecting our quality of life and enforcement. Um, I'll throw it out to both of you. How do you work together? How, how, do, you, how do you make that happen? Because I can imagine that sometimes it's maybe a little difficult. I think all the service providers uh, and, uh, and city staff and police officers, I think we're all working hard trying to figure out this issue. I think there's some things that are preventing us from being able to work together. And I believe that we've got to build a better system and we have to have police enforcement. And I think those two things working together are going to allow us to change the state of homelessness. I don't, I don't want anybody that's living on the streets to go to jail. But we've got to put a stake in the ground. You, you can't live on the streets. This is not good for you. It's not healthy. It's not safe. And it's not good for the rest of us that are living here, too, as your neighbors. And it's not being a good neighbor by living on the streets. And so we have to put a stake in the ground that, that uh, that's just not allowed. And as service providers, we got to do more at uh, building trust and getting them off the streets into programs. And if you res resist services, then the police have to do what the police do. Jared, your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Our service providers are fantastic in the city of San Diego. We just need more of them, just like more police officers. And our goal is always, like Donnie said, to make sure people get help and get off the streets before we ever get to that enforcement posture. Yeah. And that's unfortunately we're, what we're tolerating right now is, is, is going to lead to, to more problems because people are using drugs on the streets. We're not getting the mental health treatment. But I think you're both touching on something that I think really gets to the, the crux of this debate is you talk to a lot of people in San Diego and across California, which is, you know, should we intervene? Uh, should we get in there and say, no, you, you can't, don't have a right to sleep on the sidewalk in front of somebody's house or business. You need to go use some of the shelters. Or do folks have a right to do that? I mean, there's, there's folks on, on both sides of that, of that coin. I know I feel very strongly about uh, that we have to get in there and do that. But your thoughts on you know, intervention versus just hoping somebody is going to change. 
I'll take that one. You know, our public spaces belong to all of us. It belongs to our children. It belongs to our next generation. It belongs to families. And we cannot see these public spaces to people who want to use drugs, who people who want to live in them and spread out encampments there. It, it looks like a third world country in some places in the city of San Diego, and we cannot allow our city to turn to that. It ruins our livelihoods for our small business owners. It ruins the livelihoods of the people who live there. When we have police officers escorting school children down the middle of a pothole filled street because they're scared of the people on the sidewalks, is that the society that we want to build for our children? And the answer is no. We have to hold people accountable for their behavior and their actions. Donnie, intervention. Absolutely. I think that needs to be done in a compassionate, dignified way. It is our city. These are our streets. Uh, this is the place where we've raised our kids, and many people have uh, born and raised here. And so we care about this place. And, and I think that not only is it you know, the place where we live, but it, it's not what's best for the person experiencing homelessness. People are dying on the streets. Uh, the average uh, person, the average male living on the streets, uh, his life expectancy is 10 years less, and for a woman it's 20 years less. And so all the data is there, all the research is there. We have to intervene and get them help because they haven't been able to help themselves. And I think as a society, as a compassionate society, with all the resources and talent that we have, we gotta be able to figure that out. Well, I'll tell you, San Diego was on the forefront of making some significant changes several years ago, and it, it seems like there's a lot of gridlock that is happening uh, right now. Um, one of the things I'd like to ask you both, if, if, you, were, if you were a mayor, uh, you were in charge, what do you think we ought to be doing differently? What are some of the things that you would like to see our city take steps to do to, with one goal? How do, we make, how do we make a difference on the streets in uh, 30 seconds each? Our approach is very decentralized right now, and so because of that, 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 that's an advantage in some businesses, but our approach to homelessness is decentralized, so who really owns the problem? I would pull all the providers together, and we would talk about less services, more outcomes. And the outcomes need to be getting people off the streets immediately and getting people off the streets permanently. And you as a service provider are gonna be held accountable to that. The showers are great, the meals are great, the beds are great, love that. But this is about getting people off the streets. And because we've put a stake in the ground as a city, yeah. you don't get to live on the streets. Jared Wilson, final word. You know, I think a lot of our problem is as people who come here for our good weather and are homeless from somewhere else. The studies show that 80% of people become homeless here in San Diego. But the reality is you can stay here a week in a, a single residency occupancy hotel, and now you're San Diego and have become homeless here. So that's, the semantics are not friendly towards that. We have to reunite people with where they came from, with their support groups and their connections. We cannot allow people to use hard drugs on our city streets. We need enforcement on that. We need accountability. We need our, our officers on the streets and more service providers and more beds. It's not gonna happen overnight, but we need to start heading in the right direction. Well, I'll tell you, I think, I think more and more folks are agreeing with both of you, which is it is not compassionate to let somebody die on our streets, certainly. Um, and then if we don't intervene, we're not going to break that cycle of addiction. If we don't intervene, we're not going to get folks that have mental health issues or duly diagnosed off the street into a great place like the rescue mission mm -hmm. where you can get back on your feet. Uh, and the more we do that, of course, the more that, that frees up our men and women out there who are you know, spending so much time on homeless issues to do other things that they rightfully should be doing. But it takes, it, it takes all of us uh, working together. Um, and in a, in, a, in a final segment here, uh, I guess, what's, a, what's the outlook? Are, are, are we positive? Can we turn this around? I believe that we can. I think it's going to take rehabilitation. That's the word. I don't think that there's a quick fix. This is a complicated issue. But if we could be more committed as a society to uh, enforcing when necessary because you don't get to resist services, and for those that are ready to get off the streets to actually do significant rehab, which means we're addressing the issues of the heart, we're getting you into a program where we can fix the things that have led you to a life on the streets, I believe that we can change the state of homelessness. Measured by less people living on the streets in the future than there is today. Because we're not gonna eliminate homelessness. Yeah. I do think we can change the state of it. It's about outcomes. Jared? I think it's absolutely gonna get changed. I think people who live here, people who visit here, people who own businesses here are tired of how it is. And we cannot go on living this way. And our, our society will not succeed with the way downtown San Diego looks today. And it will change because people will make it change. Well, two people who are on the front lines of trying to make a change on our streets and, and saving people's lives. Thank you both for being with you this morning and sharing your, your views and uh, best of luck. We need you out there being successful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that's it for this morning's edition of San Diego People. Join us tonight for the KUSI News at 6, 10, and 11.